Mr. Chairman, um, members of the committee. Uh, in the analysis that GAO did, you know, they talk about the declines uh, in revenue due to economic downturn, changing use of mail linked to continuing shift to electronic communications and payments. Uh, one of the things that I think that the uh, Postal Service has not been mindful of, and certainly GAO is, uh, doesn't seem to have a fluency uh, with, is the problem of people who are on the other side of the digital divide, people who don't have access to the Internet, people who aren't uh, skilled in, in using electronic payments uh, over the Internet, people who don't do electronic banking. Because uh, we, we have uh, constituencies, uh, you know, I, I, I would think that they would tend to be um, people in the lower socioeconomic scale, but they also might be people who are elderly, who, who don't have the fluency with the Internet. The whole idea of universal service means universal without respect to, to age, to income, to race, or to any other uh, industry that you might use in a society. And members of this committee, we're actually looking at uh, dismantling universal access. I'm going to give you some ideas of how they're doing it. Look in your neighborhoods, taking mailboxes out of a neighborhood. Now, for some people, that might not seem like a big deal. But suppose you're used to getting to moving the mail from your house to the post office by walking, walking to a, a mailbox. Those mailboxes by the thousands have been removed from communities. Nobody talked to any members of Congress, I can promise you that, and asked for any of our opinions, whether you move a mailbox out. So then you go to closing post offices. That's the next part of the infrastructure. Uh, then the next step after that is we want to talk about doing away with Saturday delivery. There are FedEx boxes outside of some U.S. Postal Service facilities. The post office in this, uh, uh, you know, one of the recommendations that I see being made here is to move uh, to grocery stores and other retail locations, uh, post office operations. Now, Mr. Potter, have you ever had any uh, discussions, uh, you or members of your staff, or do you have any communications or memoranda or emails with respect to uh, uh, talks that you've had with individuals regarding uh, subsequent privatization of post office services, uh, any communication of any kind whatsoever? The, as part of our analysis that was done by McKinsey and Company, they did an analysis of whether or not privatization made sense. Their conclusion was that it did not. It's part of the report. And basically the reason that they said that was, was that uh, if somebody were to come in and want to take over the Postal Service, that they would want to have a, a, a pathway to profit. And the only pr pathway to profit would be to deal with legacy costs, allow the f freedom to have frequency of, regarding frequency of delivery and retail outlets. And they concluded that they would even have to go further than what we're proposing in terms of the changes that are, that are out there. So well, that, that's, they, a that's a McKenzie study. Yes, sir. Uh, but, you know, there, it wouldn't be unusual to have legacy costs dumped on the government and then have the private sector uh, take uh, cherry-pick the, uh, the profits. I mean, so I'm not a proponent of that at all. I'm saying that we are not proposing privatization. What we're trying you, to do you is preserve... Question, aside from McKenzie, did you have, have you had any meetings with anyone that say, oh, you're going to uh, let go of Saturday delivery, well, we'll fill the gap. Has anybody... Uh, no. Really? Really. No one on your staff at all? No, there's I no don't know. Talk. I can only speak for myself. I'm not aware of any. And that means that you're really not anticipating then uh, anyone else picking up the slack if you uh, do away with Saturday deliveries. I don't believe the economics are there to do it. And I look at the competition um, in the package arena, and I look at what they charge for Saturday delivery, and they put a a premium on Saturday delivery. And the lowest price I saw is an additional $12.50 per piece. 
I I'll submit some follow-up questions in writing. I thank you. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman <coughs> from Missouri, Mr. Malukenmeyer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, gentlemen, I, uh, as we were going through this this morning I'm, and we're talking about reducing service, have you had any sort of uh, cost-benefit analysis done or have you looked into what it's going to cost individuals and businesses if you cut back on your delivery service at all? We've, we've made inquiries of, of our customers and we've been talking on a regular basis with our customers. The bulk of our, our major customers have said that they can make this change uh, and make adjustments to uh, the way their businesses operates and adjust to a five-day delivery. There are some customers who simply will not be able to make a change and probably the most obvious example is uh, newspaper delivery, uh, generally in rural areas where they have a six-day newspaper. Right. Uh, obviously, if we're not delivering on Saturday, we don't have a business solution for them. But there have been ongoing dialogue with businesses. We probably would have saved well over $3.5 billion had it not been for adjustments that were made in our plan to accommodate businesses um, in terms of frequency of delivery. Okay. Um, I, I'm just curious about that because I know we're maybe, you know, cutting our nose off to spite our face here. If, if we wind up incurring more costs as a society as a result of uh, what, you're, what you're proposing here, I mean, it, it, there's another cost that's going to be passed along to the consumer right. if the businesses have to absorb additional costs as a result of the lack of mail service for additional well, day. One of the reasons would, I mean, there's a fine balance here between right. service right. and cost. And, and so uh, the pathway to addressing costs, unfortunately, you know, will affect service. Right. We do want to preserve universal service for all of America. And one way to do it is to reduce the frequency right. and keep rates affordable. Uh, and so trying to find that balance is very difficult. To follow up on a, uh, on a comment of uh, the gentleman, uh, Mr. Kucinich, uh, you know, my concern also is along the lines that if you do away with the sixth day, somebody else will step in, provide that service, or cherry pick those areas that they can provide service and make money on that service delivery. And then at the end of the day, by allowing them to sort of get their nose into the business, suddenly uh, whittle away at the rest of the Postal Service business. Is that a possibility? Uh, I don't believe so, sir. Okay. But uh, again, the competition, the main, main competition, charges a $12.50 premium per piece that, that's delivered on Saturday. Um, it's, we have a declining business. The fact that we still have a five-day network, uh, you know, I think makes us extremely strong and uh, we are very efficient when it comes to the, the handling of mail. Well, you know, you use the FedEx and UPS folks, and they, they, they provide a similar delivery service of, of packages, so therefore they've already cherry-picked out part of your business. And it would seem to me that it would, be, it would make sense that if you gave up part of the business, somebody would fill a void there on part of it that can actually make money. And before long, they wind up expanding that service to all five days rather than just the sixth day. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not going to say as a concern. I'm, yeah, I, I'm not going to say there's no risk, yeah. but I think the risk is minimal. Yeah. Um, in your testimony here, uh, both of you, uh, Mr. Hur and Mr. Potter, both talked about uh, expanded products and services, and you mentioned one, I think, uh, Mr. Hur, with regards to the new box that uh, right. whatever fits in, one, one price and off it goes. Uh, it's a neat concept and it works very well apparently. Uh, what are the products and services do you uh, have in the pipeline or considering or things that uh, uh, may be on the horizon for us here? Well, I'll give you one example that we just shared with uh, the convention that we had down in, in Nashville this week. Uh, we're entering into a, a, an agreement with Hallmark that they will sell prepaid envelopes for their uh, greeting cards. So it'll be one-stop shop, you buy the card, yeah, you're buying the prepaid envelope at the same time. We're using an intelligent mail barcode, which is a new code that, that we've been deploying to uh, help us with the accounting of, of that process. So that's an example of just trying to bring added convenience to, uh, to the customer base. Well, wow, that's interesting. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll you back to balance my time. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. I thank the chair, <clears throat> and I thank uh, both of our panelists for being here this morning. Um, 
Mr. Mr. Chairman, I I will, uh, with your permission, enter my full statement into the record. But I, I must say, I continue to be bothered by the fact that the approach to trying to deal with the issues of solvency and long-term viability of the Postal Service continue to be ad hoc. And I, I must confess to some disappointment in the GAO report in particular uh, that we're not looking at a more comprehensive new business model approach. Um, ad hoc cuts to delivery service may save money in the short run at long-term cost in terms of uh, customer base. And, uh, and I, I think Mr. Shapitz raised some very legitimate concerns about going from six to five days a week. I, I would note with historical interest that this discussion occurred in 1976, uh, where a similar situation was faced, and the Postal Service again said, if we don't go from six to five, we'll never make it. And subsequently, of course, the Postal Service actually experienced some record profits uh, without cutting service from six to five days. Um, I'd like to ask the GAO rep, uh, you know, we keep on talking about this $238 billion in cumulative losses. And, and I bring to your attention the thoughtful testimony of, the CS, uh, of CRS, which says uh, you have to look behind that number. Uh, first, uh, there are certain assumptions made about what will or will not happen in terms of economic growth and customer base. Uh, for $238 billion. Secondly, you'd have to ignore the statute uh, that says uh, there's a statutory debt limit actually in USPS. And then you'd have to assume Congress does absolutely nothing for 10 years and that uh, you'd borrow $231 billion from the U.S. Treasury. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a little hard to believe. So I, I'm a little concerned that in banding about this $238 billion number, uh, we're ignoring some obvious things that are going to happen. And it's, it looks, frankly, a little bit like a scare tactic uh, to get us to make some, some decisions that may or may not be popular. And they may, in fact, be viable decisions. But how real really is that $238 billion number? And would you care to respond directly to the Congressional Research Service report, page 11, that lays out the flaws in this $238 billion number. Well, I, I, I appreciate the question. In, in looking at- Could I beg you to speak up, speak closer to the mic, I can't certainly. hear Certainly. In, in looking at that uh, number, I mean, we realize that is the number that says if nothing else changes, and I agree. It's very, things will change. There's attrition that's expected. Uh, one would, have, you know, given the drop in volume and uh, revenue, uh, the idea that the Postal Services would be self-financing, one would expect that that, uh, number is probably the by far the the worst case scenario uh, it is the number that's put out there in this to provide some context for what happens if nothing were to change it's but it's understood that things would have to change in the interim well and 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 we would do nothing for 10 years i would assume that would not be the case right so how real then is the $238 billion number that's been bandied about in testimony here and in the press? And I, I mean, one, one begins to conclude it has no basis in fact at all, other well, than to scare people. Uh, I think that it's a, uh, I think it's a starting point. I mean, again, this is a number that the Postal Service uh, came up with, but it's, I think, to provide an illustrative case of, the, uh, of not doing anything. And if nothing's done, then you will face those kind of challenges. Could I ask Postmaster General Potter to respond to that? Uh, well, I agree with what he just said. It's what happens if nothing is done? We did lay out a way of closing $123 billion of that gap. And again, through aggressive management, focus on productivity, there's, a, there's an element of growth that's built into that $123 billion. However, there is a sizable gap beyond that. Yeah, uh, can I interrupt you just one second there, Mr. Postmaster General, because you make a very good point. You'd have to assume for $238 billion to be real, we do nothing, including you. You've already said you're going to use the authority you have to make reductions totaling $123 billion. Is that correct? That's correct. So the $238 billion number is already not real. It's a theoretical number. A theoretical number, right. except that you've already announced here you're taking steps to make sure that theoretical number is never real. Exactly. Thank you. 
I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton, for five minutes. Uh, General Potter, it's good seeing you again. Good to see you, Mr. Chief. You've Mr. been there for a while, and I, you've done a good job, and I, I really don't envy the position that you guys are in right now because uh, with uh, the Internet and everything, it's got to be a real problem. So. Well, I don't envy the federal government either, so you have a tough job yourself. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> Uh, according to Congressional Research Service uh, testimony, the Postal Service has reduced its post office inventory by slightly over 15 percent since 1970. And I assume that these facilities were closed for reasons other than or in addition to profitability. Uh, last year you began to review stations, branches, which the Postal Service maintains that is not subject to the same legal hurdles as post offices. Uh, in the absence of these legal hurdles, how many branches have you shuttered? How many will you close? Or are you still in study mode? And this is the question. It's my understanding that the Postal Regulatory Commission estimates that, that all closing uh, small and rural post offices will yield savings of about, of about seven tenths of one percent of your operating budget. That doesn't sound like very much. Is that going to make a big impact? Okay, let me try to answer all those questions first. From stations and branches, we did have a, a national review of stations and branches. Our uh, local offices uh, made recommendations for changes. Uh, subsequent to that, we got uh, we received the advisory opinion of of the uh, uh, Postal Regulatory Commission, and we also completed our analysis on the plan that we submitted to you as part of my testimony. We're in the process of reviewing those recommendations in light of the Postal Regulatory Commission's uh, suggestions as well as to make sure that we're aligned with our plan to assure that there is access, that we don't close anything without assuring that the community has access. So, so far we've closed none. Okay, regarding post offices, I think there's a, an assumption that um, if, you know, post offices were under review nationwide that somehow small post office would be the target of, of the change. Um, and I, I will just tell you that Canada em embarked on a review of their post offices to determine where they had alternate access in light of some of the challenges that we similarly face. Uh, they would close offices where there was no access. And much to their own surprise, what they found out was that uh, many of the rural posts, post offices ended up having to remain open because of the fact that there was no alternative access in many of those communities. So it's a matter of not a, we don't have a plan to abandon any community. We recognize universal service. The question is, how can that best be provided? And if, you know, finding a location that is open seven days a week and 14 hours a day or more, if that provides better access to a community than a post office that has more restricted hours, then that's the choice that will be made. So uh, again, I, I think that a lot of people rush to judgment about what the outcome of the process will be, uh, and we have not embarked on it. But no, there's no, no one back in, he in Postal Headquarters saying, this is the community and we're going to wipe these out. It's going to be a matter of a process and it's going to take a lot of time. Well, so I presume we'll see you back here after you go through your study and make your, your decisions. Right, and I, I think it will evolve over time, and it'll be on a community by community basis. Okay, it's not going to be made at a national level. We don't know, you know, what's going on in Was the state of Washington or in Florida. Our local managers know best what's down there. Okay, uh, I think Miss Maloney asked this question. I don't think she's here now, but uh, I think you you said a one year fix uh, was supposed to fix the problem that we might be facing as far as going to five day delivery service from. Uh, six days. Uh, what happened? No, uh, just let me see if I can clarify. One of the things that we we believe was that we overfunded uh, the Civil Service Retirement System Pension Fund. We believed that back in 2003 when the law was changed that it's declared that we were overfunded by 17 billion dollars. At the time the Postal Service felt that it was overfunded by over $100 billion. And uh, we appealed to the Board of Actuaries uh, at OPM, and they said, no, the, the way OPM did their analysis was correct. In the 2006 law, Congress added a 
provision that enabled the Postal Service to appeal to the Postal Regulatory Commission to have an actuary review that decision. We have made that appeal, and I believe the Postal Regulatory Commission is reviewing that. Should a decision be made that would benefit us in terms of that split that occurred back in you know, 1971 uh, over who paid for what, uh, then we would use some of those funds to delay moving from six to five day delivery. Okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I ask one more real quick question? Uh, I'd like to ask this question of uh, Mr. Herr. Uh, I think GAO has uh, recommended that, uh, that uh, the pre-funding uh, be continued at the Postal Service. I'd just like to know if, if GAO had to do pre-funding, how much would that cost? Uh, what it would cost GAO as an agency? Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I haven't done that analysis. Well, I, I'm just curious because you recommended that the Postal Service be pre-funded, and a lot of people agree with that. But I'm just, we don't do that with any other agency of government. I'd like to know how much it would cost. And if you could give us that for the record, <clears throat> I really would appreciate I, it. I could ask our financial office to see if they can put that number together. Thank you, sir. I thank the gentleman. <clears throat> the chair now recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for calling the hearing. And I certainly want to thank the witnesses for appearing. Actually, I want to commend Mr. Potter and his management team, along with the stakeholders and unions, for holding together a system that I think we've sort of been asleep a little bit with. I noticed that Mr. Connolly is not here, the gentleman from Virginia, but I think he makes a very astute observation, and that is that there has been some negligence in terms of planning for this day and sort of knowing that it was going to come. It sort of reminded me when I was in uh, undergraduate school and my advisor had me take 10 hours of German and I should have been taking 10 hours of Spanish. And I'm sure that he meant well. I mean, he had his rationale and he had his motivation for doing it. And I'm sure that some of the approaches that we have taken, we have meant well. But I think we had to kind of know that we were moving in the direction just with the change in environment the change in economies and the changing of time that we would be at this juncture. Mr. Potter, let me ask you, if we were to refund or transfer the overpayment, and I guess the idea is that this would give us some breathing room to try and search for more long-term solutions, how much time, or do you have any projection relative to how much time that might provide us with? Depending on what, what was done with the money, you know, if we've, we've kind of examined what we would do. I think it gives us a, a five-year window, assuming that we could take the monies, pay down uh, our, our debt, the debt that we have now, assure that we fully fund CSRS because there's a there's a potential $10 billion there that, that, that might be, there might be a gap, and then use the funds to prepay the retiree health benefit trust fund payments that are, are, that are due in the next five years. I think it could, it could cover that gap, but I think at that point in time, we'd be sitting down again talking about how we affect the changes that we've laid out in our plan. Well, let me just say that for this one member, uh, that sounds like a very rational approach to me, that, that, that there are no simple solutions to very complex problems and circumstances. And obviously it's going to take a tremendous amount of, of, of understanding, negotiation. I mean, we have all of the stakeholders that we want to try and keep in business. We certainly want to recognize the problems and, and, and workplace concerns. 
of the men and women who actually process and deliver the mail. And so I think that this is an approach that, that we certainly need to be pursuing. Mr. Hearn, let me ask you, what does high risk mean to the Government Accountability Office? Uh, the, uh, Congressman Davis, uh, GAO has a list of about 30 agencies that uh, are high risk in different areas. We, in the case of the Postal Service, we refer to the high risk in the sense of the financial condition of the Postal Service, and by that we're referring to the idea that Congress suggested that uh, the Postal Service be self-sufficient, that is, to have revenues that cover its costs. It became clear last summer that that was very much at risk given the decline in mail volume, the decline in revenues, and then what that meant for their business model in terms of their operations. And so if I were to translate that into layman terminology, it would mean that something's got to be done. Yes. Otherwise, things are going to get worse. Well, yeah, you could, you could say that that's a good way to put it. And finally, let me just ask you, uh, you did mention that, that we need to re-examine our structure for collective bargaining right. with the management of the Postal Service and the unions. Could you just kind of amplify that a bit? Yeah, part of that is the, the thinking that is the, the, they go into union negotiations this year that if something goes to binding arbitration, simply that the condition of the, the financial condition of the Postal Service is taken into consideration so that there's uh, the possibility that whatever agreement is reached through that process, that it's going to be one that can be sustained going forward. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu, for five minutes. Mr. Uh, Potter, on the five-day delivery question, um, my uh, issue is once we go down this road, where does it all end? It's my understanding that once the language requiring six-day delivery is repealed, there would be no legal barrier to prevent the Postal Service from reducing delivery days further from five days to four days or three-day delivery. Um, and certainly we've seen postage stamp rates increase with alarming frequency more and more so that for me it's, it's even hard to remember what the last postage stamp uh, rate was. On delivery issues, um, Business Week magazine called, the po called on the Postal Service to shift immediately to three-day delivery uh, within days of the Postal Service's announcement of its action plan. And of course, that would be really alarming. It would destroy half our jobs, but also likely lead to a death spiral for the Postal Service with less service leading to less mail volume, leading to less service, and so on. Um, so, Mr. Potter, what, what guarantees, if any, would postal workers and the American people receive that there would not be further reductions in delivery days? Uh, let me just say, uh, Congressman, that we, uh, woman, that we uh, did look and try to look out into the future, and what we did do was build a 10-year plan. And so our plan is suggesting that, assuming that there were a broad an uh, array of opportunities to close the financial gap, that that's all we would have to do in the next 10 years is move from six to five. However, I, we haven't looked beyond that. In fact, you know, there are many folks who are saying that our estimate of 150 billion pieces of mail in 2020 is, is optimistic. Um, I hope it's not, and we're going to work hard to try and beat that plan, that, that, that forecast. But there are no assurances beyond uh, the the next decade, uh, I think it's going to be a function of America's use of the mail. And uh, you know, when, when you think about that, I look at the Postal Service. We're mailing less than we had in the past. The federal government is mailing less than, than they had in the past. Most businesses in America are mailing less mail, and most Americans are mailing less. Going forward, we think that that trend is going to continue. So it does create a very complex situation for us. And for everybody, how do you match our use of resources with the revenues that we're going to take in? Well, my other question is whether switching to a five-day delivery week would actually accelerate the loss of customers uh, because letters mailed on Friday night would not be picked up till Monday morning or Monday afternoon. Uh, less frequent delivery is going to accelerate the shift to electronic invoicing. 
uh, booming businesses like mail order prescriptions would be threatened because they count on Saturday delivery. They might go over to FedEx or UPS. Um, and as they open accounts and become more comfortable with these other services, they'd start to use the postal services less. Uh, so it seems that Saturday delivery is the postal services key strategic advantage over its private competitors um, over uh, say UPS and, and FedEx and, and gives away one of the more important uh, comparative advantages um, in the one area of the postal market that's likely to grow when the economy uh, recovers. Um, so over time, the loss of revenues could outweigh the short-term savings. So how, how is the Postal Service going to make up for those lost customers? What's very interesting, I, I went around the country and talked to a lot of uh, CEOs and others who are in business. And when you sit down and you talk to them and you say, for example, you mentioned uh, DVD rentals. You sit down and you talk to those folks, what's your ideal business model for it in the next decade? And their business model would be out of the mail. They would do downloads to people's, you know, to a box that people have in their home. And so their long-term business model is to move away from the mail. Likewise, when you look at bill presentment and bill payment, the ideal model for these folks is to have 100% of bills presented online and 100% of bills paid, you know, through, you know, online. They recognize that America is in a state of transition, that they're never going to get to 100 percent. And so they need the Postal Service to support their transition into a, a future state. And the, the real challenge for all of us is, how does the Postal Service change as America changes? And that's what our plan presented, was the fact that, you know, we have to be realistic about what's, what's happening going forward, and a lot of folks uh, Congressman Davis and Congressman Chaffetz have talked about the fact that we really need to be thinking about the future and designing a plan to move in that direction. And that's what we attempted to do with our plan. It's balanced. You know, literally everybody is affected by what we did. Nothing in it is easy. It's all hard decisions that had to be made. And so it's the best that we could do in terms of trying to come up with something that we think was fair and, and affects people in a moderate way. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Speyer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for your participation uh, this morning. Uh, to you, Postmaster General, let me ask you, uh, in your opening comments, you referenced that one of the things you could do was create incentives for early retirement. Um, are you seriously thinking about that? And if so, what would that look like? We've already done that for the two unions where we had excess employees. And what we, we incented with uh, folks who are eligible to retire. Uh, we provided an early out for those who were within five years of retirement as part of that effort and, and uh, two $7,500 payments, one the day they retired and then one a, a year later. For other unions, we haven't offered it because we actually are in a position where uh, we need the employees that we currently have. Uh, and so uh, downsizing makes no sense in a, when you need the folks that you have. Why pay people to go? So even Just with hire. management now, you're not looking at any incentives for early retirement? There's no economic justification okay. to do that right now. Let me um, move on to another line of questioning. Of the 150 billion pieces of mail, how much is direct mail? How much will be? Or how much, is, or how much will be, if that's a, that's a futuristic thing. I believe it's 57 percent. So 57 percent is direct mail. Are you losing money on catalog delivery now? We're not covering our costs on some catalog delivery. So wouldn't that suggest that you have to increase the cost? The price? Yes. Yes. The cost to the catalog company. Well, there's, there's two ways of addressing it. One is to try and take costs out of our system to try and bring our costs in line with what people pay, as well as raise the price to bring it in line. So how much are you losing money? What, is it $100 million? Is it $10 million? Well, It depends on, on what category of mail it is. But there are several, classes of, of several types of mail that are, uh, are not covering their costs. I'm talking about catalog mail in, in 
particular? I don't. Uh, I can provide that for the record. I All don't right. know it off the top Would of my head. Would you do that then? Have you looked at other countries and how they're dealing with what have to be similar issues around their postal service? Yes. In Germany, they charge 80 cents for a stamp. In Canada, they've gone from six-day delivery to five-day delivery, the same in Australia. But generally, if you look around the world, we have the uh, lowest price stamp, uh, lowest price postage in, in the world for, for uh, uh, you know, uh, developed countries. Uh, in addition to that, they are starting to look at things that we have done to grow volume. So they're looking at advertising mail. They're looking at things like um, uh, opening up their network to allow people to bring mail into their system at different levels. We are the most, the, we are the largest post in the world. We deliver over 40 percent of the world's mail. We are the most open post in the world in terms of providing users of the mail access at all levels, not just at origin, but you can bring mail to destination and pay a rate. You can bring mail to the delivery unit and pay an even lower rate. So the, the, the key to our business model has been volume. We have a, a business model that was built on volume. It worked tremendously. But through, that's not what our business model is going to be moving it forward. It can't be going forward because now volume is going away because of electronic All right, I have a, um, a couple, one major question, and I apologize to Chairwoman Goldway for stealing her thunder a little bit, but in her testimony that she will be making later, she says, in the Postal Service plan, regrettably, there is no growth, no reju rejuvenation, and little innovation. It sounds to me that if we're going to continue to have a postal service that is viable, there's lots of changes that have to take place. But probably the most important change is one around innovation, whether it's electrifying your vehicles or looking at derivatives in terms of uh, protecting yourself against the increased cost in gasoline. No, I'm serious. I mean, you're an end user, just like the airlines are an end user for gasoline. They use derivatives to protect themselves against the cost of uh, gasoline uh, or petroleum from going up. I mean, I think we've got to look at the entity differently. Whether or not you should be able to um, actually uh, contract with catalog companies to provide better rates for uh, the volume of shipping that is going on, because there's still, if online purchasing is going to be a thing of the future, then your shipping function is going to be far greater than the envelope. So, I mean, I think the innovation is where we're lacking right now, and I would encourage you in the future to, to look at that. My time has expired. Well, regarding derivatives, we'll follow the lead of the federal government. You buy a lot of gasoline as well. <laughs> As I understand, the uh, post office is also paying state gas tax. Is that correct? No. You're not? No. Okay. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Clay from Missouri for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me thank you uh, for holding this important hearing to address the essential issue of securing the future of the United States Postal Service. Uh, we have all watched the service suffer under the strain of unprecedented financial law, and it is clear that a myriad of solutions are necessary. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to urge all of my colleagues to continue to assess this matter and challenge us to move past controversy uh, to find real and helpful solutions. And with that, let me ask Mr. Potter. Uh, according to a summary of your report, uh, the Postal Service rejected cost-cutting alternatives like central, centralized boxes. Uh, can you tell us about the customer polling and other research uh, that was used to reach this conclusion? Yes, we, we went out and surveyed customers. The McKinsey, McKinsey and Company surveyed uh, you know, a a broad array of, of a uh, statistically representative sample of America and asked them uh, a number of questions around alternatives that the Postal Service has to reduce cost. One of them was to take a, the mailbox from your door and move it to a street corner cluster box, which exists in, in many communities around the country. Newer communities are serviced that way. Over 90 percent of Americans or the 90 percent of those surveyed said that would be the worst thing 
that the Postal Service could do in terms of the array of options that, that was in front of them. They said that would be, the, in their minds, the biggest degradation to, to service. And, for example, they looked at six to five day delivery. Every survey I've seen, two thirds of the respondents say that they'd be okay with that. Uh, but on the other side, in this case, 90% said absolutely not. That would be a big diminution of service. And that's why we pulled that option off the table. It's worth a couple of billion dollars in savings, but if the American people doesn't, don't want it, we don't want to go down that path. Okay, a, a, another of these rejected proposals was to offer service, services besides mail uh, at offices and branch locations. It seems to me that expanding your products and services would make the post office a kind of one-stop shop uh, for customers and would increase revenue. Do you agree with that assessment? As Congressman, we want as much freedom as we possibly can get in the law to look at options to do things uh, outside of what, what the, the current law says. In 2006, the PAEA was passed, and it, it was extremely and is extremely restrictive regarding what the Postal Service can do. Basically, it sells stamps, deliver mail, and engage in the package business. We think there are other opportunities for us to generate revenue and um, we'd, we'd like to have the ability to study that. And so if you were to change, to expand your products and services, what short and long-term effects uh, would this change have on the service? Short-term, probably none, because one of the things that we did as part of our study was look at whether or not we should be asking to specifically get into other types of businesses that uh, posts around the world are in, like banking and some folks sell cell phones and, and other things. and. Uh, what we concluded was that any business you might want to get into has a certain amount of risk and would require capital investment. Given our financial situation, we're not in a position to take risk, nor do we have the capital to invest. But we would like to have the freedom to study these and perhaps when our finances uh, become, you know, we're in a better shape to uh, begin to explore these other options. In the meantime, uh, we certainly would like to consider anything we could do at a post office to serve the federal government because we are, if you think about it, 37,000 outlets for the federal government. And we do today do passports. If there are other things that we could do, we would certainly want to get engaged uh, to do so. Okay. On the uh, six-day versus five-day, can you give me a quick breakdown, basic breakdown on how much this would save? It'll save three billion dollars per year, and that'll grow obviously as inflation in terms of some of fuel costs and employee costs goes on. So I think if you looked at it ten years from now, it'd be worth over four billion. Okay. Final question, Ms. Maloney noted that you are from the Bronx. Does it make you a Yankee fan or a Mets fan? <laughs> you met Yankees, of course. <laughs> Very good. The chair recognizes a gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll thank our witnesses for being here today uh, with us. Um, can you tell me how, how much of the United States uh, taxpayers' money now goes in annually to the Postal Service? Uh, we do get about $100 million for services that are provided, but other than that, there is no subsidy, uh, so zero. A customer. You get money for, for them being a customer. Excuse me? You get the $100 million because they're a customer. You get it for services that you provide to the government. Yeah, we have to, pray. for example, we have to pr provide free matter for the blind that moves through the mail, and we, and we provide free overseas voting. Uh, those are the two things, the services we provide where we're compensated for them. And other than that, not a dime of taxpayer money. Exactly. So uh, I, I don't want to pick a nit with you here or anything like that, but you generally refer to the American people and you, you survey the American people as you're really surveying your customer base. Exactly. On that. Um, can you tell me from your studies, your work on that, do you think there's a social value to what the Postal Service does to the public in general in any sense of the way? Without a doubt. I think we, uh, I, every week I probably sign five or six letters to employees who do things that we never get any recognition for in terms of being the eyes and ears of, you know, a government entity in local communities, whether that's saving people in a burning building or 
you know, alerting people, the local police, if there's a crime being committed. It's, a, it's amazing what we can I do there. I agree with you. How they put it, but even aside from that, just in the everyday delivery and performance of your mail, do you think there's a social benefit to the general public to the service that you provide? Yes. And could you give me a couple examples of what you think those are? Uh, well, I, I think just the fact that there's a lot of people who are shut-ins and the fact that they get mail every day is their connection to the outside world. Uh, I also know that we carry a lot of mail for nonprofit organizations and that we're the main conduit to raise monies for charitable organizations, you know, throughout the country. And so that conduit gets shut off. I think a lot of people are negatively harmed. Mr. Heard, do you agree with that? Do you have any uh, additional thoughts on that? I, I would agree. I think that uh, your, your question gets in, in part to the uh, issue raised by uh, Congressman Kucinich about the social value of the mail and providing services to folks who are on the other side of that digital divide. So let me ask you, if we don't make these changes and things keep going downhill, what we're really looking at at some point is some privatization of this. Uh, and if a private company were to take over this responsibility, would it be fair to say that we could expect that you wouldn't get mail necessarily delivered to your doorstep? That's an option that they would pursue, yes. You can bet that the prices would go up significantly? I would think so, other than in some local, in rural areas and suburban areas, without a doubt. Uh, and you can bet that some areas we can serve it all, correct? Well, but as a business decision, you may not bring it out to the person that's uh, living in an area that's difficult certainly to Certainly that's an option that, that would exist, so universal service would be threatened. Okay. So in all of your business planning and your assessments on that, did anybody take into account um, some contribution from the taxpayer for the return of all the benefits that they get from having universal service through the Postal Service? No, uh, we did not. We're not proposing that, uh, but that is certainly an option that, that you folks, folks in the Congress could consider. Well, I mean, it would have been nice if somebody had studied that. You had all these fancy people, Boston, whatever, I forget the names of the firms, everything like that, proposing ways to uh, privatize and uh, otherwise do things. It would be nice if somebody could have taken that aspect and put a value to that uh, and then talked about that. Is that something you might uh, consider doing? Well, we have put a value on universal service, which is something that was built into the original law. There was a, a provision in the original law back in 1971 for the Postal Service to receive compensation because of the fact that we provide universal service at a loss in some cases to different locales in the country. We put a price tag on that of about four billion dollars, and it was done uh, recently. And we could share that data with you. Okay. And did you ever get the four billion dollars? No. And if you updated what the value is in today's present cost? Well, that's what it is. It it, it had so been uh, a smaller amount. Now. A smaller amount, and now in today's dollars, it's like four and a half billion. But I'll get the exact is that an number. Annual, uh, value? annual annual number. But I could just go back a little bit historically. Prior to 1970, the Postal Service, 20 percent of the cost of the Postal Service was provided for by appropriations. And every year coming up and asking for money became problematic. Oh, I know. And the Postal Service ended up in a very poor condition in the late 60s because of the difficulty in getting appropriations. That's why we've been reluctant to ask for it. I remember it. reading it and watching it, and I know sometimes people don't appreciate the value until they lose it. Uh, by that, but at 80 cents uh, a delivery of an envelope it might get people's attention. I think we'd lose a lot of mail, though, and a lot of jobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your comments. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Watson, for five minutes. I would like to uh, thank the chair for this hearing and the witnesses for your time and patience, and I will direct this to Postmaster Potter. Uh, one of the changes uh, mentioned in the Postal Service's action plan for the future is to create a more flexible workforce. While the report states that a leaner organization can be achieved through attrition, as a large number of your employees are expected to retire in the coming years, the report advocates replacing retirees with part-time workers. Uh, this concerns uh, me because part-time work often results in underemployment where people do not have the opportunity to make a living wage or to revive certain benefits. And uh, the postal services have a very personal uh, appeal for me because uh, my mother worked there for 34 years and I worked in the post office in Los Angeles for seven years myself. 
and got through college because of it, and the rest uh, is evident in the successes I have uh, had. But uh, what percentage of the workforce uh, do you envision employing part-time, and how will the Postal Service uh, ensure that these workers are fairly compensated for their work, and will part-time workers still be able to participate uh, in collective bargaining processes? First of all, I share your experience because I, I was a clerk and worked my way through the, the Postal Service, so we, we share that background. Regarding part-time, we would want to maximize to the fullest extent possible the number of full-time employees that we have. That's number one. We're not talking about abandoning that. We want to maximize full-time employees. However, when you look at our processing centers, we now have machines that process mail at 30,000 pieces an hour. When you look at those jobs, they're not eight-hour jobs. They might be six-hour jobs. And so we're not, and by the way, we're not, when we say part-time, that's not a euphemism for non-career employees. We're talking about people who might have career jobs but might work six days a week, you know, six hours a day, uh, as opposed to being working eight-hour days, not because we have a preference for six over eight, but the, the work would drive you to have per, a person working six. One of the things that we've done is consolidated tours. I don't know if you worked in the plant, but we've consolidated tours now to try and maximize eight-hour jobs, and we'll continue to do that. But when you look at the competition that does some similar work to us on the package side, and you look at the folks who work in plants, uh, those, they have a much higher percentage of part-time employees than we do. Ours is less than 10, theirs is upwards of 40. And we believe that, again, it's a matter of aligning the work and picking and, and hiring the people to, to fit the work. Again, maximizing full-time jobs. Uh, we're not abandoning that. I grew up, I was a member of the union, we're not ta but we do have a fiscal responsibility here, and we have to balance the two, and we have to keep rates affordable. Uh, is the real issue the fact that people are using the postal services less and doing more on computers and so on. Yes. Uh, what is the bottom line and why are we in this position? The answer to your question is yes, that is the main cause of, of the challenge. Uh, I think when we hit the recession, we kind of hit a tipping point. There were a number of things that happened all at the same time. Businesses went back and had invested in doing business online. They wanted to maximize the benefit from that investment. And the way they did that is to try and drive as much as possible transactions online. And by the way, it's not just business, but you know, it's even the federal government. Next year there's a law that is going into effect that would have anyone who uh, does tax preparation, if you do more than 20 tax returns, you have to file online. It's a good way of doing business. We're not trying to stop progress, mm -hmm. but we, are, in effect, are in somewhat, uh, you know, the victim of changes that are, are, are taking place. So this is not a matter of our employees not working hard. They're working very hard. They're providing the best service that I've ever seen in the history of the Postal Service to our customers. It's a matter of, you know, the American public and the businesses' behavior changing and the tools that they use to conduct business is changing, and we have to change with it. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to, you know, that issue, and having been in that system as I just described. Uh, if you go to part-time, uh, will you continue the uh, kinds of benefits that you have now for your workers? Uh, you know, way back in the day, in a, another era, right. this was a perfect uh, job for single mothers to take care of because all the benefits were part of the package. It still is. It still yeah, and is you could great adjust job. your hours and all. Right. So uh, I'm very, very concerned if you change that, that we don't uh, put, place people in a lower category. Right. If they're career so, employees, as I described, there'll be a mix of some non-career and career, but the career employees would get the full benefits that, that we provide under our contract. In fact, the non-career employees, based on the health care plan that was just passed, uh, we're going to have to work through the work rule, the rules around that, and they'll provide provided health care uh, as required by law.
I see that my time is up, Mr. Chairman, but I just have to make this statement. In some way, I don't see it getting any better because more and more and more people are online. And it's impacting uh, a lot of different uh, kinds of services and industries, too. Uh, you're waiting for recommendations from this commission, is that correct? I know we've we've laid out a plan. You laid out a plan, and already. we're executing what we what we're in control of and under that plan, okay. and we're asking Congress for some flexibilities that don't exist in the current law, so that we can you know embark on different things to bring our costs in line with the revenues we expect. Well, I hope I think I heard when I came in to the meeting. I've been late. Uh, that you are not going to uh, get rid of uh, Saturday deliveries. Is that correct? No, we're proposing that we do. There were a number of panel members who you heard suggesting we not consider it. But I think it's something, what we've put together, uh, Congresswoman, is a series of, of solutions and ideas on how we can close the gap. And I think what we have to, and we've suggested to everyone that we have to have very serious dialogue about all of those solutions and make tough choices on well, what we I need want to, to go on forward. record as opposing any curtailment of services on Saturday because many of us who have to travel from here all the way across country, the only day we can get our mail on our hand is Saturday and act on it because we turn right around and come back here. I live on the West Coast. So please, 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 and I'm asking my colleagues too, uh, I would strongly suggest that you continue Saturday deliveries. And with that, I yield back and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady for her thoughtful comments. Uh, <clears throat> I, I believe this panel has suffered enough. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but before proceeding to uh, second panel, I'd like to ask unanimous consent from my colleagues that a uh, statement of the full committee chairman, Mr. Towns, and a statement from the National Association of Retired Federal Employees be entered into the record. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Uh, I want to thank both of you for your, your testimony, your help, and uh, as, uh, as Mr. Issa and, and, and Mr. Chaffetz have commented, and, and Mr. Burton, uh, you don't have an easy job. We've got some tough decisions to make, but I appreciate the work that you've put into this, and uh, I look forward to working with you on, on these problems as we move forward. Uh, bid you both have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, sir. And I would welcome our second panel to take their places. Let me welcome our uh, distinguished witnesses for the second panel. As with the first panel, it is the committee's policy that all witnesses are sworn in. May I please ask you to rise and raise your right hand. 
Do you solemnly swear that this testimony that you will be giving before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that the witnesses responded in the affirmative. Please be seated. I'm going to offer a brief uh, introduction of each of our witnesses. I believe each of you have uh, been here previously. You know the, uh, the deal with the lights and the, uh, the testimony. When it turns red, you should probably uh, sum up your testimony. Uh, first of all, the Honorable Ruth Goldway uh, was designated Chairman of the U.S. Postal Regulatory Commission by President Barack Obama on August 6, 2009, and she has served with the agency since 1998. She is an experienced regulatory and public affairs professional with expertise in citizen participation, consumer issues, urban planning issues, as well as the mailing industry. Mr. David Williams was sworn in as the second independent inspector general for the United States Postal Service in August of 2003. Mr. Williams has served as the inspector general for five federal agencies. He was first appointed by President George H.W. Bush to serve as the inspector general for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission from 1989 to 1996. President William Clinton next appointed him Ex Inspector General for the Social Security Administration from 1996 to 98, and then as Inspector General for the Department of the Treasury in 1998. In 2001, President George W. Bush named Mr. Williams the Acting Inspector General for the Department of Housing and Urban Development while he was also serving at the Department of the Treasury. Mr. John O'Brien is Director of Planning and Policy Analysis at the Office of Personnel Management. He joined OPM in April 2009. Prior to that, Mr. O'Brien was the Deputy Director for Research and Methodology at the Maryland Health Services Cost Review Commission. He has a Master's Degree in Public Administration from Syracuse University. Mr. Kevin Kosar has been an analyst at the Congressional Research Service since 2003. He is the author of many CRS reports on the United States Postal Service, and he is the contributing editor at Public Administration Review Journal. He received his PhD in politics from New York University. Welcome all, and uh, Chairwoman Goldway, you have the right for a uh, five minutes opening statement. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Lynch, Ranking